So I just want to thank everyone for coming on a early and uh, rainy Friday morning. Appreciate you guys uh, coming and, and hearing me uh, talk about stuff in general. What I thought we could do is um, I'll give you guys a little background on myself, uh, how I came to the venture industry, uh, a little bit about uh, corporate venturing. But what I'd really love to use this time is, you know, this is really your time. And what I thought we could do just to start off is think about certain topics that you guys would like to cover. Uh, we'll whiteboard it. I, as I promised Doug and Herb, I, I don't like PowerPoint uh, presentations, so I've kept that uh, promise, and I did not bring any slides uh, purposefully because I really don't like PowerPoint and the way it constricts one's thinking. And I kid you not, two weeks ago, I was having lunch with an entrepreneur. We were going over his idea, and I said, he's like, oh, wait, you know, I've got this, I've got this PowerPoint deck. Let me, let me just bring it up. And he's trying to find it on his Mac. And ultimately, he really couldn't start giving me the presentation without actually finding the deck. And so it made me realize, and it really crystallized, that too often the PowerPoint deck is really the crutch. And we've kind of lost this basic human interaction of just having a conversation. So I'm all about more conversation and less presentation. And to that end, I have no presentation. But I'm more than happy to walk you through my thoughts. So please just shout. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whiteboard and use this whiteboard. If you guys have specific topics that you'd like me to cover, I'm more than happy to do that. All right? Uh, any, any, uh, just shout them out. I'll, I'll write them up here. Valley of death. The valley of death. The valley of death. OK. Can you elaborate on that? Is it called the uh, credit card period? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. How to approach a corporation for their internal uh, venture? Approach, follow up, and sell OK. In terms of areas that I like to invest in? Yeah. Okay. rounds that corporate VCs invest in? OK. 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 Any others for now? Any others? We can add more topics. I'm sure um, one, of the things, one of the reasons why I love doing this is because these topics usually end up having subtopics and even more topics. So I got into venture almost 10 years ago. I spent seven years, well, it kind of goes even further back. So I started my early career in uh, technology investment banking. I did, I did two years straight out of undergrad focusing on enterprise software. After that, I went straight to a venture capital firm called Institutional Venture Partners, or IVP, which is based in Menlo Park. And IVP focuses on later stage growth equity investments. And they've now raised a total of 14 funds, so definitely one of the older funds in the Valley. And they've, done, they've been very, very successful in, in um, companies such as Twitter and HomeAway and Snapchat, et cetera. And then about two and a half years ago, I had an opportunity to, to leave IVP and join Intel Capital in a partner capacity 
where I focus on internet and application software. So this would be a great time to touch upon Intel Capital's strategy and focus. So at Intel Capital, we invest roughly $300 million a year, um, and that's every single year. It's been pretty consistent. We invest in basically everything under the IT umbrella. And where we feel like we find the best deals is basically two Venn circles uh, coming together. Institutional investors focus purely on financial return as they have a fiduciary duty to their LPs to make money. And at Intel Capital, we layer that as well as a strategic component. We feel like the best deals are where a company can take advantage of both the financial economics of a deal as well as the strategic piece. Now, that strategic piece tends to be a continuum. So when I say everything under the IT umbrella, I really mean everything from technology ma manufacturing, which obviously works in conjunction with our fabs, to everything, and I, that's, that's really one end of the spectrum, and as you can imagine, that is super strategic. The other side of the spectrum is the area that I focus and cover, which is internet and enterprise software. So the reason being is because when you look at a lot of internet companies, and we can think of the Facebooks and the Twitters, the Airbnbs of the world, one might initially think, what, that, what does that have to do with chips? But as we all know, there are chips on your phone, there are chips in the cloud, and a lot of that is powered by Intel. And by no means am I saying that our investments lead to selling more Intel chips, because that's clearly a, a more tactical, strategic approach to investing in internet and digital media, digital marketing. What I am saying is that the investment organization of Intel Capital looks much further beyond, three to five years out, of how something like a Twitter, a Facebook, or even things like an Uber can have certain primary and secondary effects on certain markets, right? Just think about Uber. Think about what effects that has on people's daily driving habits. Think about how that's changed the black car market, or even the Prius market because of UberX. Think about how that changes, let's say, insurance. So these small businesses that really begin with great ideas and get executed upon over several years have larger impacts on our society, much broader things than just selling chips at a very tactical level. So think of it as, this is the way I, I characterize it. If it's to do things tactically within the next 12 to 18 months, you should talk to our M&A team, because that's, that's who is probably best suited for your business. If it's something that over the next three to five years, uh, we think you know, Intel Capital is, is best suited for that, okay? So I'll check off the, the Intel Capital strategic focus here. We're a multi-stage investor, as I mentioned, 300 million a year. We invest in, in all stages, in all sizes. So we do everything from a $200,000 seed check to a $200 million uh, pipe deal into a public company. Now, our bread and butter is probably a five to $15 million check, new investment from us. That's kind of on average. And I would say we tend to err a little later. So we do do Series A's, a number of Series A's, but I think truly we're better at B's and C's. Um, things that have, you have a product, it's selling the market, you want to accelerate your revenues, uh, you want to reach customers. And I think one of the, the clear value adds, and this is a huge Intel Capital commercial, is we have a 15-person business development team that we have in-house that's sole focus is to help our portfolio companies. We will get you in front of the right people at Toys R Us, Comcast, P&G, uh, Visa, MasterCard, you name it. Like We have a number of these things, and we call them Intel Technology Days, where <laughs> a lot of the CIOs and directors of these companies will, will work with our uh, business development team and say, hey, you know, we're challenged with storage, with big data, with social. Can you bring together 15 portfolio companies? We'll roll them, roll them through on an ITD day. And often those lead to um, either purchase orders or contracts within the next 12 months. Um, I've seen that with the portfolio companies that I've invested in. And it's a huge, huge benefit. It's something that comes along with the capital. All right, so let's just take these in order. Um, Number, so the first topic was valley of death. So 
Think of um, risk reward. If you're building a company, the more traction that you have, uh, the less the VCs will take from you in terms of a percentage of ownership because you've actually proven out that model. And I actually feel like the, the valley of death stage is, is probably one of the most exciting and yet one of the most daunting areas to be <laughs> because uh, the highs are super high and the lows are extremely low. You're, you're kind of schizophrenic between depression and euphoria at the same time. <laughs> and I've often found that if you can get past that through uh, friends and families, I think never before, what we're seeing is that there's so much capital out there, and especially at the seed rounds right now, there's so much money from just wealthy individuals, uh, wealthy entrepreneurs who have done it before that have capital, that want to continue to support this ecosystem and continue to support innovation and entrepreneurs in whatever endeavor uh, that is. And so personally speaking, for me, I don't, I don't play at the seed level because I think that there's plenty of capital chasing those entrepreneurs, and that's not really a white space for me to, to invest in and around. Um, some of my partners do, and they really like um, doing a lot of those seed deals for speed, for education, um, to get into a market. But for me personally, I'm not really a big fan of doing a lot of those seed investments because there are great people who do that already. And I see it as just pretty, a pretty crowded space right now. And so when someone comes to me and says, hey, I've got this great idea, I'm looking for 50K and I'm trying to raise a million dollars, I have plenty of friends who do that and that is their bread and butter business. That's not really mine. And so when people come to me and say, okay, I'm having trouble raising it and I've talked to X, Y, and Z people, for me as more of an institutional investor, I think about, okay, well, why hasn't this person been able to raise this money? Because there is so much money. I would say that never before has it been able, easier to start a business, but never before has it been harder to scale a business. And so while it's really easy to, to get a business off the ground and get it started today, it's actually really quite expensive scaling companies. And that's why you see a lot of these businesses raise really small seed rounds, sometimes really large seed rounds. But then when you look at the total capital that goes into a business today, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars before they go public. And, and, and most of it, I mean, you can make sense, right? I mean, engineers, extremely expensive, extremely difficult to recruit in the Valley today. And so when you need to add the first engineer, you know, it's hard, but not that bad. But when you need to add the next 20 engineers, that gets really expensive. And, you know, you're, we're in this beautiful space in San Francisco. Like, real estate is not cheap, right, for anyone who lives here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. So there's a lot of reasons why it's so expensive scaling companies today. But um, I hope that that covers the first point. Okay, so the second point today is approaching corporate venture capitalists for money. Like, what's the best approach? And the different rounds that corporate venture capitalists invest in. So let me start by saying the approach for corporate venture capitalists are different. So I don't want to uh, paint a very broad brush because I think there's actually more variation with um, corporate venture capitalists that I've come across than, than institutional firms. What I mean by that is I would, I would basically put um, corporate venture capitalists in, in two buckets if I were to, to really simplify <coughs> and overgeneralize um, that space. So there are corporate venture capitalists, you got to figure out what are their motivations for investing in your company? How are the VCs that either potentially uh, will join your board meetings as an observer or director, how, how are they compensated? How are they incentivized? Right? Um, the reason why you should ask these questions is because uh, never before has there been more money being invested by corporate venture capitalists today. Right? Um, if you look at some of the um, PwC Dow Jones numbers, um, that, that trend is continuing to scale as a number of corporations figure out that investing their corporate dollars into future innovation is an early way to understand what the market is doing because companies inherently have quarters that they have to make. And they are so focused on what I need to do today. 
but so rarely do they ever focus on things that are going to happen over the next two to three or five years. And so they really see investing in future companies as a real innovative way to continue to see what's going on in the market and sort of a low friction way to get into that market. Now that being said, not every corporate venture capitalist is built the same. And what we've done at Intel Capital is we've tried to mirror a lot of the incentives that, that uh, occur in an institutional firm as we do uh, here at Intel Capital. And I think you'll find the same at Google Ventures as well. Um, and the reason is because when you, when you are about to exit or you're getting acquired or you want to go public, you want to have like-minded people and similar incentives around the table. And so what I usually tell entrepreneurs is, you know, not every, not every board member is created the same. And too often, first-time entrepreneurs go after the term sheet that has the highest price. And that price often comes at a price, unfortunately. Because you may not have the right chemistry with that board member. That board member is an ambassador to the firm and to the capabilities of the firm. And too often, a lot of first-time entrepreneurs fall victim to, oh, I got a term sheet from this top tier venture fund. I've made it. And little do they know that the person that they've just partnered with probably or maybe isn't the best person to be on their board, isn't constructive, isn't value add, um, sits on 17 boards, is not the right person for them, but Sequoia invested or Excel invested or you know, name, you know, pick any top venture fund. And so that's critical when you think about also your corporate venture capitalist who's going to be either an observer or a director. And a lot of, of first-time entrepreneurs think, I can control them. They're a minority investor. You know, it's not going to be a big deal. But look at the, the minimal dilution that I'm getting. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, I've talked to too many entrepreneurs who have said, gosh, I wish I didn't take that term sheet. And for those who get the opportunity to do a second and third company, the one thing they'll always say is, I'm never going to do that again. I'm not going with the highest term sheet. I want to go with the person who's going to be the best partner, who's going to be there when times are tough, who's going to actually return my text at 10 o'clock at night, who's actually going to respond to me, not a week later, but within a day. Like Those are the people that you want to surround yourself with, not the people who are willing to pay the highest price. And so I would say that most corporate venture capitalists kind of fall in those two buckets. One where they do have a financial incentive to make you win, and those that Eh, it's nice if you win. And they, they will help propel your company into different areas within the organization. So why would you go to a corporate venture capitalist versus going to an institutional fund is probably a, a sub-bullet of this question. And I think the, the real thing is access. What type of additional access do you get to that organization that you wouldn't necessarily have if you didn't take that capital. And so you can think of Intel Capital, you can think of Google Ventures, Qualcomm. I mean, there's so many companies out there that have uh, corporate venture groups. The other thing that I would say that you should watch out for is not all corporations have a very structured process in terms of how they make an investment decision. And typically, unfortunately, that means that the decision from a first meeting to when they wire you the check is typically elongated. So you should really ask them when you go in, what does your typical deal process look like? How long does it take? Do you lead deals? Do you take board seats? Um, you know, what does your involvement look after the investment? How have you helped entrepreneurs scale their businesses? You should really, really dig deep into these questions because you don't want to get lost in the, in the mud of, you know, I don't know where I stand with this corporate, but, you know, I'd really like to have some of their money. And I, I think it's really helpful when you elucidate to them why you think it is beneficial to take their capital versus not taking their capital and how that may impact your own business. Can, can I add a follow-on? Yeah, is please. Or 
are they compensated? <laughs> I think the, the, the real question is, is there a financial incentive? Like I've always said, if you want to see how well your sales force is doing, just look at how they're compensated. Like what is the structure of how they get compensated? And so I think that's true for corporate venture capitalists, which is that person who comes to your board meetings, who's there every quarter or every other month, <laughs> Do they get an incentive when you make it financially? Oh, I, let me restate my question. Okay. Is do, when you're going in the door, I want to understand their motivation and how they're incentivized to make investments. Most, most of them will say, we, we do it because we want to see what's, what's on the come, right? In some ways, you know, some... Some, like Cisco, use it as basically a call option. I mean, they typically will in invest and then acquire a number of the companies that they invest in. And they see it as an early foray into what might be acquired. And initial capital is totally different. I think we've only acquired, like, out of the 1,200 companies we've invested in over the last 21 years, we've in I think we've acquired five. So we don't use it as what I would call long-term M&A strategy or a way to, to do M&A instead of comp like getting into an auction, right? So I think people have different perspectives on how they leverage it. Uh, some actually just use it as a way to diversify capital. You know all these tech companies have billions of dollars on their balance sheets, right? And so they will sometimes use uh, that as a way to diversify uh, that a little bit. It's, when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Like, if, you're, if you want to invest in China, and you've got all this offshore cash, but you can't bring back to the U.S., why not invest some of that in, in interesting companies in China, for example? I'm not saying that's Intel Capital strategy, but I'm saying that that could be a strategy that a lot of other corporate venture capitalists employ. And so for that matter, I think generally a lot of corporate venture capitalists tend to invest later, but I know that there are a lot that also invest in seed and early. So like Google Ventures, for example, they, they have a, a very active seed program. So they can go very, very early as well. So I think there's a whole gambit of what stages uh, corporate venture capitalists invest in. It's, I don't want to paint it with just such a broad brush. All right, dilution. So this is the this 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 topic's this topic's a lot of fun because uh, clearly as an entrepreneur you want the least amount, and as an investor, I would I would say that I've evolved my thinking. Uh, you know, it's it's typically a pretty pretty challenging situation when you're trying to negotiate a term sheet because you know the entrepreneur wants more and you know the investor wants more, but I think of it probably slightly differently as an investor now. I think about it as um, yes, I mean, I would like to have more, but I don't want to make it so punitive that I'm going to start worrying about your incentives as an entrepreneur. Because that is clearly, you know, the entrepreneur is doing all the work, right? I do, I, I provide capital, I provide help, you know, I provide coaching, I provide introductions, I help with strategy formulation. But the entrepreneur is the one who's dealing with the stress of building the business, the, the, sweat, the sweat equity that goes into building this business. And so if I take too much or I feel like I take too much and the entrepreneur feels like they take too much, uh, that I've taken too much, that's not, that's not a, a very good situation to start with. And so I think I've evolved my thinking over the last you know, 10 years of investing where I want to do what's fair. And either we both feel we, got, we both got a bad deal but if someone feels like they got a good deal and someone got a raw deal, that's not going to work out. And what's more important is we are playing long ball here together. And it's truly a partnership. And so I think there are ways to minimize dilution. And the way you do that is in a very early, early stage, to kind of touch on point one of valley of death, is at the early, early stages, you've got, let's say, me on your board and you've got the CEO. There's not a whole lot of data. And so what you have is conjectures. You have a conjecture about how the market's going to um, be created. I have a conjecture about how it's going to be created. I can tell you because I've seen it in five to 10 companies that I previously invested in that were successful. And you can tell me about your own personal biases about how market will develop, et cetera. 
But all we have are conjectures and not a whole lot of data. And so I'm going to I'm going to ask that I get paid for the risk that I'm taking to invest in this company because at a very early early stage the risk of me losing millions of dollars is pretty high. I mean, failure startup rate probably as bad as starting a restaurant in San Francisco. So I want to be paid for that risk. And I would say in the current climate, there's a lot of risk that's just not being discounted all that much. I mean, we're seeing, I mean, WhatsApp at 19 billion aside, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's just not being discounted right now. You're seeing that in the public markets, and that's a direct reflection in private market valuations. So great time as an entrepreneur to be raising capital because a lot of investors are clearly not discounting a lot of risk. And I'm not saying that there's a bubble right now, but what I'm saying is that there's just, it, it's, it's an interesting time where you're probably not taking a whole lot of dilution and you can raise you know, capital from a lot of people. And so getting back to kind of the original question of dilution, if you can prove that your model works, if you can prove that you have users, if you can prove you have enterprise customers and you've scaled and you've done it on the backs of credit cards, you've done it on the backs of your own house, you've done it on the backs of friends and family who are willing to throw in 10K or 25K and chip in and, and help you see that vision. As long as you have data, data will always trump any conjecture that you have. And the, the, the example I love to point to is Airbnb, because honestly, how many of us would have thought that people would be renting their houses or their living rooms and that that would work and be a huge, huge business, right? It takes crazy people to think of that stuff, go execute upon it, and say, see, this works. Now, the, the reason is because you may not want to rent your house out, but your neighbor might, and his or her neighbor would also too. And so different strokes for different folks, but data always trumps any conjecture. And the more data you have pointing up and to the right, the less you will have to sell of your soul to a venture capitalist, for sure. All right, crowdfunding. I think crowdfunding is really exciting. So thing, if, you, if you guys aren't familiar with crowdfunding, I'm sure you've seen it with like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, um, AngelList uh, to a certain extent. And one of the reasons why I think this, this area is so exciting is, number four, I mean, this basically lowers the bar to start a company. Now you can just throw up an idea, like Coinbase, or you know, a lot of things that like uh, on, on Kickstarter, and before you even have a product out, people are just basically saying, I want to I wanna buy a wait list to be an early adopter of this product, even though you have no product yet. And it's a way to kickstart a project. I mean, it's, it's really, really interesting. The barriers to that type of funding, I think, have been lowered. And I think that's awesome, especially when you know, the US economy is just starting to get its legs back. Uh, I think it's awesome that we continue to innovate around new funding sources. Now, I think a lot of people will ask, well, doesn't that impact your business as, as, as a VC? And I would say it's very complimentary because when you want to get things, I just said it, right? I mean, data trumps all conjecture. So if you can get more data, you're going to get a higher value for your company. And the only problem that I see with a lot of these um, crowdfunding sources is that there's not one main person who's going to meet with you on a regular basis to help shepherd you. Yes, you've had a million people say your product is cool, but how many of those million people or how many of those 10,000 people are going to sit down with you and strategize? Because we all know business strategy is an art. It's not a science, right? And who's going to help you hire your first engineer or your 20th engineer? It's not those 10,000 people who bought your product or said, I'm going to wait in line and I want to be the first to have your product. Who's going to help you when they say, I want to go raise a real Series A now? I mean, those aren't the people on those platforms that are going to help you. But I think those platforms are extremely important. And I think they're going to, I mean, I, can't, I can only imagine how many more companies will be started um, with people who have you know, really uh, crazy ideas who probably didn't think they would work, but that there's now a market for it. Because like I said, when you're sitting in a room with one VC and it's yourself, and we both have conjectures, usually the one with capital who's not going to fund you wins. So this is to say, hey, look, I've got 10,000 people who are willing to pay this. You're like, oh, really? I didn't know that. Well, that's going to that's gonna trump all conjectures. 
All right, so topic number five, areas of investment that, that I focus on. So as I mentioned at Intel Capital, we basically break up everything under the IT umbrella. We've got people who focus on, my partners who focus on semiconductors, on security, wearables, internet of things, enterprise, um, and I happen to cover internet and uh, software. And the areas, the specific area of software that I cover tends to be at the application level. So some of my investments include Box, uh, Sprinkler, uh, 500 Friends, Nexmo. Um, I've made a total of nine investments over the last two and a half years. Um, thankfully, none of them have gone out of business yet, uh, which is great. Um, one of them actually got acquired last year, and it was a very healthy return in about uh, in a, just under a year's worth of work. Uh, again, all the entrepreneurs' work, not mine. Um, but happy to share in the success uh, of, of that acquisition. So I tend to focus within internet and application software, that's probably a you know, trillion dollars worth of market um, space that I could be looking at. Uh, within internet, I tend to focus around marketplaces. Um, I really like this idea of how software is changing the world. When you think about what Airbnb is, when you think about what Uber is, they are software platforms. And what's interesting to me is how these software platforms make assets more efficient. And that to me is really, really, really interesting. When I think back, I mean, I was a really, really early, early intern of eBay, uh, which was obviously one of the more successful marketplaces. I think about how much friction was in that, that really successful marketplace. I don't know if any of you used eBay in the 90s, but there was no PayPal. Um, there were not really a great way to do payments. And so you would bid on a product. People were misspelling their products on the platform. You won the bid. You got an email saying you won the bid maybe two days later. Then you would write a check out physically, mail them the check. The seller would then cash the check. They'd wait two days to make sure it wasn't a fraudulent check. And then they would say, great, the cash went through. Now the guy's going to, or gal, would package up the, the stuff that you bought, probably junk, and then mail it to you, and then you would finally get your product. I mean, you think about how much friction there is versus an Uber today. You press a button, say, I want, a, I want a black car or an Uber X, and it comes magically in like five minutes. You don't have to take out cash. It's all done in the cloud. They've got your credit card information, so if you you know, had a night of drinking, you barf in the cab, you even have to pay for that too because they've got your credit card information. You're not going to probably be a serial killer because they've got your credit card information. Um, so there's just so many great things about this software platform. But without that software platform, you create huge inefficiencies in the market. I remember when like black cars would just be sitting and they didn't have much business and they would you know, start, hey, hey, do you need a black car? You know, we've probably all been solicited by black cars. You're like, get out of the airport. Hey, do you need a black car? Do you need to get to the city? Um, why do that now? I mean, you've got an amazing software platform. Same with Airbnb. And that's why I'm super, super excited. I'm, I'm looking at white spaces about where you know, these can continue to proliferate. Like when you look at commercial real estate, these you know, startup companies sign like seven to 10 year leases. And the commercial real estate broker takes a huge percentage of that lease. Very fat percentage, by the way. So why is that? Why, why, does, why does that have to be that way? And I love it when entrepreneurs say, it doesn't. And I can make it better. Those are, those are, that's disruption that I personally love investing in. Why? Because there's not a whole lot of competition, number one. And number two, you're basically creating a new market and sort of there's, there's a lot more you can do versus a super competitive market that you're just trying to take a small piece of. So that's the internet side. On the uh, application software side, I have, uh, you know, I'm guilty as charged. I, I've invested in a lot of companies that basically sell to the CMO. And there's two big trends that I, that I see. I don't think, I think that the, the death of TV is, uh, is probably a little bit extreme because I know all my friends continue to watch TV, even though they always say they don't watch TV, but they're always talking about, oh, did you see that episode last night? And I'm like, well, yeah, you don't watch TV. But I do think that the model of how TV advertising, which is a $60 billion plus market, will change. 
it's going to shift, and it's going to go somewhere. Just like the Yelp pages, you know, all the money that went into Yelp pages has shifted disproportionately to Yelp and other localized services. How I think it's going to shift is to direct response marketing. We've seen a lot of acquisition dollars chase companies like Responsys, like Blue Kai last week, um, Buddy Media, Vitru, Wildfire. I mean, the list goes on and on of Exact Target, Radiant 6. I mean, I can go on and on. The reason why this shift is, is seismic in my mind is because number before, have CMOs had all this access to data on their users. Never before have CMOs been in charge of actually very large IT budgets. Yes, they've had historically large budgets when it comes to brands, like making Super Bowl ads and spending money on advertising. But never before have CMOs been given the tools to say, how can we do this more efficiently? And what's interesting about that is I have this, this belief that over time, you're going to see budget shift from the CIO to the CMO. Because that's going to be the lifeblood for a lot of companies who do a lot of direct response marketing. And so I believe this trend is at least 10 years or more that's going to be happening. And so that's why I've invested in 500 Friends, which is a social loyalty lifecycle marketing uh, management company in Sprinkler, which is the leading social engagement and listening platform, um, in companies like Bright Edge, which is a search engine optimization platform, and um, you know, to a certain extent, Box as well. Um, so I believe that these new models are going to change consumer behavior, and that's why I believe in basically investing in even more stuff that we can sell to the CMO suite effectively. So marketplaces and SaaS application software, two areas that I focus in. All right, characteristics of investments. So <clears throat> was this question, was this more about like what I look for in a successful company? Okay. And, and an individual I look at four basic variables when I evaluate a deal. So at any point in time, if I tell you I don't like your, if I, I don't think this is the right time to invest for me, it's usually along these four variables. The first is a team, but that's a touchy one because you're basically telling the entrepreneur that you don't think he or she passes mustard. Um, I think that there's a season for every manager, and I truly believe that just because you're a first-time entrepreneur, it doesn't mean that you suck. It really just means that you have a lot to learn, and that's not a problem because for people who say they don't invest in first-time entrepreneurs, means that they won't really have a long-term business in the venture <laughs> um, capital business because, I mean, there's only so many repeat entrepreneurs you can back. And as, as for, for those in the audience who have actually been at a startup, it's a lot of work. And after you've done one or two, the chances of you doing like three or four, a little bit challenging. So the first is team. Uh, I'll be the first to say that uh, above all else, I love backing great teams. Um, I think about what it's like to potentially see myself at a board meeting, working with this person day and night. I, I'm more than happy to take phone calls at 11 p.m. or midnight, whatever it takes to make the entrepreneur successful. So I expect the same from that entrepreneur. I do take calls on the weekends as well. Um, because the thing is, the thing that you have, the single greatest weapon you have as a startup is focus and speed of execution. For any of you who work at big companies, you know that at big, huge behemoth companies, they are slow and execution is questionable at times. Uh, but what big companies do have is probably huge distribution and a heck of a lot of capital. So what's scary to me isn't that Google is in a market. What scares me as an investor is if Google has decided to focus on the market segment that you're focused on as a startup, and they're going to plow a billion of their, uh, which would be like an infinite, I think a billion dollars for Google is like a month's worth of ad, ad, ad worth. So they just plowed a little bit of that into yours. They can win. But it doesn't really affect me from a market perspective if Google or Oracle or Salesforce is in the market. I'm only concerned if they've decided that they're going to now kind of crush everyone in this market segment that is, is new. So I, I love backing teams where they have no other option. Um, you know, some people call them the cockroaches. Like if, 
if the world were to end, they would still find a way to make their company successful. I mean, they're the last people on earth who would see that company fail. Those are the people that I love to back day in and day out. Now, that also means that it's a person with probably a lot of pride, a lot of ego, very strong personality, but that's okay because my kids are like that, and you just have to learn how to manage it. Um, and not to say that the CEOs I work with are my kids, but what, what is really important is those are the people that you want to see succeed in life. Those are the people that when their backs are to the wall, they're not just going to say, hey, you know what? It's game over. I tried, but I failed. It's the people that say, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to figure this out. I'm not going to lose you money. I'm going to make this work. Those are the people that you know in your heart. They will find a way. They will find a way to make this work no matter what the situation is, in good times as well as in bad times. Okay? Now, I only know that because I've only, you have to work with a number of management teams. So like, when I see a pitch deck and it says, we have a great management team, like, that's great. But what's more important is you, know, you have to trust sort of a VC's background that they meet with teams day in and day out. Like, I meet with probably like at least five different entrepreneurs every single day. Right? Not, I'm not always right, like whether or not they're great, but like I said, that's why data trumps everything else. Okay? So the first is team. The second is market. What type of market are you approaching? Is it a big market? Generally, usually yes. Right? The reason why you want to approach big markets is because if you have a small percentage of that market, you can build a $100 million business. That's the question that I'm usually trying to answer is, can I see your business being a $100 million revenue business? I don't like it when entrepreneurs come to me and say, I'm going to build a billion dollar business. Well, what does that mean? Like a billion in revenue or like billion in market cap? Because you and I can both agree to disagree on what multiple public, you know, public investors will put on your company. So all I care about is can you build a $100 million revenue business? In the beginning, that's all I care about. Like even better if you can build a billion one. But can I see you to $100 million? Um, and maybe you're not the person, and maybe you agree you're not the person to build to 100 million, but I'm going to give you all the rope in the world to see if you can try to build that company to 100 million or more. So the second is market. The third is product. Like, do you have a great product? Is it a great product experience? I'll be the first to tell you that you know, I'm a consumer just like everyone else. Uh, I, you know, I didn't grow up in a product manager or product marketing role, but I think like a lot of people, I can see great product when I use it. You know, I'm the first to say that I'll be the first one using your product, probably even before I speak to you. I'll give you immediate product feedback on where I think it could use some work, where I think it's, you know, annoying me with like 10 different pings a day, or maybe we can slow it down or do things more efficiently. Um, you know, the last is, is basically deal variables. That's the last one. Um, there are so many great companies that, uh, that, you know, I wish I could have invested in. But just for that moment in time, whatever reason, it's just too expensive. Maybe your last round was too expensive. Maybe we can't get to the right structure. Maybe we agree to disagree on what the, re the right price is and what the right dilution is. Um, but th those are basically the four variables. And usually, I won't do a deal based on one of those four. And generally, I will say it's not usually the team, but it's usually the last three. Those are. Those are uh, does that help answer your question in terms of what's typically a good deal? All right, China and Silicon Valley. I have two investments in China. I think China is an amazing place. It is super exciting, super polluted. Um, probably not the best place um, to, to, to see blue skies. Um, probably a great place to, to get cancer uh, one day. It, I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I was in Beijing last year. We were landing at the airport. And we, I know we were getting lower. Because I'm usually on a plane at least every other week. But I couldn't see anything. I was like, where is this airport? Like, you know, when you land in San Francisco, you start seeing the mountains, depending on where you come from. You start seeing the valley, the peninsula. You start seeing the bridges. And then all of a sudden, like, the water. And then the water cuts off. And then, boom, you're, you're landing on the, you know, on the runway. In Beijing, I'm like, I'm like it's so <coughs> smoggy. And I grew up in LA as a kid. So I know what smog looks like. And I was, I was just like, this is amazing. Um, 
Anyways, uh, that's neither here nor there, but I think China is an amazing, amazing place. I think the most successful venture capitalists in China will be the ones that grew up there. Um, I invest alongside one of my partners in China who grew up in China. Um, I'll be the first to say, even though I'm Chinese American and my parents immigrated from Taiwan, um, and I do speak fluent Mandarin, like that's not enough to figure out the best deals in China, unfortunately, right? It helps when I don't make the entrepreneur speak English and we can do meetings in, in Mandarin, but it's not enough because I grew up here. I grew up here in LA. I was born in LA. I grew up in LA. I came up here right after graduation. I've been in Silicon Valley for you know, more than 10 years now. And so I have lived and understand the, the American lifestyle and the American way of doing things, the way that we, um, how we interact with technology et cetera, uh, the market landscape of, of, of the US, et cetera. What I like to do in China is, for my partners that focus on internet and SaaS level application software, I, I collaborate with them and say, hey, this is what's happening in the US. Can we go find companies that do this? Like we're, so that we can strip out business model risk as well as technology risk. Because we've basically proven that it works in the US. Now that's, then we decide that that's not always the case. Like, you know, perhaps, you know, like for example, Uber's, I mean, well, I think China is just a, a very unique market to begin with, but I would, I would, I'd probably go out, go out to say that the Uber of the US and the Uber of much of the world is probably not the Uber that's going to be uh, successful in China. And primarily because I think China is just that unique of a market. Um, so, is there an interesting company or entrepreneur set in China that we can go back, that we can fund? Um, and what's interesting about the Chinese market is, like for example, I think we would all agree that we, we have less uh, social network fragmentation in the US. Like for a while there, a lot of people thought Facebook was the de facto winner, like there was no other social network that was gonna proliferate beyond Facebook and now with that Twitter and and Pinterest have arrived. I think people are kind of of the mind that you know more than one social network can exist in the US. Well, that's been true in China for a very, very long time. Like they've never had this de facto Facebook um, phenomenon that won. So the way that the interplay between how things have developed here versus things have developed there, and then we try to collaborate and find the best investment. So that's the way we do it at Intel Capital. But longer term, super bullish on China. Um, you got over a billion people there. You got more billionaires there than we do here. I know China has a lot of problems. Um, just like any other growth company typically does, a growth country has a lot of problems as well. I'm sure the leaders of China are smart enough to figure that out. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting place to invest. And it's super, super exciting. Um, you think the entrepreneurs here work hard? Uh, the entrepreneurs there just don't sleep. It's amazing. I mean. Saturday, Sunday, I don't even think they know what a weekend is. Um, so it's just amazing. Uh, the work-life balance is just work, balancing work. Uh, it's not really life in, in China. Yeah. But you know what, it's, it's super exciting. Like, I'm glad I'm not the entrepreneur there, but uh, it's, it's super exciting and it's, it's really contagious. So how about your China, Chinese tech and You know what's really interesting? Um, so, so Chinese, uh, Chinese. You're talking about Chinese immigrants who start companies in the valley. So, what is the? What do I see for mainland Chinese immigrants who want to start companies? Okay. So Chinese startups who want to expand into the US. Well, we already got funding and we keep going to um, kind of expand to the US because there are other uh, opportunities. Okay. Uh, and the opportunity is to build the skills and skill training and so that the people who can um, have transition to different uh, roles and can be helped. So what's, what's the question? I guess I'm not. So I get the scenario. What's the question? Uh, Chinese uh, startups to do business in, in the U.S. 
So you want my, my take on Chinese startups doing business in the US. So I think for those that are going to raise an institutional round, like let's say from US investors, I think most, most investors like to be close to their companies because it's easy to stop by, drop into the business, understand what's going on. Like I've got companies based in San Francisco, San Mateo, you know, on down along the peninsula. It's really easy for me to just drop in, say, hey, I want to spend an hour with you on, let's say, how do we, can, <clears throat> how do we best recruit the, the best folks in engineering? Or how do we recruit the best folks here? How do we look at this market and just sit down, do a lot of whiteboarding with a lot of these companies? I think it's tough for US investors to, one, um, fly to China you know, every other week. Um, it's a long flight. Um, it's just hard to be close to the companies. And I think for a lot of investors, they want to feel like they are part of the success or failure. Oh, they're moving here? Oh, so they're, gonna, they're moving the whole operations here? OK. Well, then effectively, they'll, they'll effectively be like a, a US startup then, right? So I mean. I mean, look, I think if you look at 60% of the top tech companies are founded by first or second generation Americans. That's just a fact, right? And so I think the Valley's been a phenomenal place for immigrants to come here, start companies. Uh, it's definitely more of a meritocracy. It's not a pure meritocracy, but it's more of a meritocracy. Um, I think what's, what's, what's an interesting corollary to that is when you look at the number of first and second generation uh, venture capitalists, it's not 60%. It's actually like well under 15%. Um, so that's, that's a stat I hope to change uh, personally. Like I think that's an interesting stat of why is it that you see 60% of entrepreneurs who have founded um, our first gen or second generation American have founded the top 25 tech companies by market cap, but you don't see that in terms of from the investing side. That includes minorities in venture capital as well as women um, in, in venture capital. Um, I, I'm hoping that that stat will change over time. But I think that, that should prove to you that um, Silicon Valley is very open to immigrants who, who are, are willing to risk it all to found companies and to, to see it through their success. Yep. Since you have talked about China, can you draw some sort of comparison between China and India, where the market Similarities are there, differences are there, and in your opinion, what has worked? You know, taking Uber to India or China or many other companies, what other concepts do you think can work or cannot work? I I personally have not spent as much time in India, um, so I can't really speak to uh, what those investments look like in India or kind of the the vice versa or the comparison between India versus China. So I won't even start. Because I'm probably going to say something that people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to look like an idiot. Um, so I, I won't even start. Like, I'll be the first to tell you, if I don't know something, I'm not going to sound like I'm an expert in something. I do know a little bit of China, because you know, I go there fairly regularly. I have two investments there. One of them you know, got bought already and was a was, you know, good exit. I've not even been to India. I would love to go there. Um, everything I hear is just basically from all my Indian friends who go there often and my investing team in, in India. So I will be the first to say, seems like it's a very exciting place. Another, another country with over a billion people, those are all facts. And um, it's, it's probably a great place to, to do business. But I'll be the first to say I have not you know, dipped my toe there, um, so I won't even Fiend like I'm an expert on, on India. This one. Yeah. How did you make your decision to invest in Bob? Basically, along those four variables um, that I mentioned before. So, a great team. Um, if you've ever met Aaron and Dylan, they are really young. I think Aaron's probably 27 by now. <laughs> and I always say, leave it to the young to change the world because they don't have mortgages. They generally don't have kids. And they're a little bit naive. 
And as you know, we were all young once. You have a ton of energy. And so I usually tell people who are graduating from school, there's no better time to start a company than when you are really, really young. Because that bar only gets harder once you try to buy a house in Silicon Valley or you have your first kid. Like your risk profile personally changes. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't entrepreneurs who do that, because I have backed some who, you know, are, I mean, God bless their, their wives or their husbands, you know. It's, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of work. Um, for Aaron, it was, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, I had known Aaron for, for a couple of years uh, by the time I decided to invest in Box, and that's generally how I like it. I really hate the uh, shotgun marriages where you've got a week to decide that you're going to invest or not invest in this company. And so I really love the data points where you get to meet with an entrepreneur when you're not fundraising. Just tell me about the business. I'll tell you what I know. If there are ways I can help your business before I even put money in, that's a great way for you to get to know me. It's like, let's start dating before we decide to get married, right? Versus, you know, there are a lot of deals in Silicon Valley right now that are happening very quickly that are like, I've never met you before. I don't know you, but I need 20 million. It's like, OK, let's slow down. Um, <laughs> For Aaron, I've known him for, I knew him for a couple years. I saw how his business continued to scale. You know, on those four variables, great team, great market opportunity. Um, the, the product is sticky as hell. I mean, people just don't churn off box once they start. And in fact, more people use it. Like, people buy more seats year after year. So there's just a natural, inherent, organic growth story besides them selling more seats to new customers. Um, competitively, at the time, it wasn't like there was G Drive and Sky Drive and blah, blah, blah. But I think those services tend to be more uh, fixated on the consumers, like more akin to where Dropbox is competing. And Box is purely enterprise, um, primarily today. And I think that shift in their business um, really gave them an early lead in terms of what enterprises need for them to deploy a solution like Box. Because, I mean, we've all been there. We, we need to send a 20 meg file. What do you do? Uh, I don't know. Email it to Gmail and then mail it to someone else. Like, no one says they do it. IT knows everyone does it. I mean, that is way more dangerous than implementing something like Box. And so when I talk to CIOs uh, as well as other organizations within the corporations who deploy something like Box, they say, I know how people are using it. You can track it. I've got admin controls. Um, there's security, there's an SSL layer that goes on top of it. I mean, there's so many admin rights and controls that come along with it that aren't included in a product like Dropbox. And if you look at historically uh, software businesses, I wholeheartedly believe that consumer software and enterprise software tends to be bifurcated. There are very few software platforms that actually can target both effectively. And that's primarily because the way you sell to an enterprise is different, than the way they, is different than the way you sell to a consumer. And what a consumer cares about, enterprise IT guys may not care about, and vice versa. So I think that there's plenty of room for both Box and Dropbox to coexist, as well as G Drive and, and a number of these uh, file sharing. And one of the things that's really important from a market perspective to understand is, I mean, we all work in the confines of an enterprise. Files are like photos uh, for the enterprise. And that's why I think it's totally pervasive. The only, only, only thing that was tough about the box deal was the price, because it was expensive. But in hindsight, it looks like we'll, we'll hopefully make some money. Like, we will make, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident we'll, we'll make money. So deals tend to have this fluidity about them about they look really expensive, but if they continue to grow and scale like a rocket ship, over time, you look like a genius. Like, man, that was a great deal. Glad we did it. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the rundown on Box. Any other questions? You mentioned um, <clears throat> with the Dali uh, subject there, uh, traction. And um, I'm just wondering what level of traction you think you need to like be your personal view before you actually do it start off the pattern as an investment in scale. It's, it's different for everyone. Yeah. Um, so I came from my VP, as I said. They're a later stage and, and growth equity firm. So I would say that my bias and my personal investment uh, area tends to skew a little bit later. So for me, generally, I like to start meeting with companies. If they're a SaaS company, they're doing about 500K 
a month in revenue. So that's like a $6 million run rate. That's, that's me. So my partners cut seed checks, so I don't want you to think that Intel Capital with a broad brush um, focuses on that. Um, and then for, for consumer internet companies, it's a little different, right? You can't just place a, a revenue, because let's be honest, a lot of these internet companies don't make money. Like WhatsApp, they don't make much money. Or Snapchat, or uh, you know, a number of these hot internet, consumer internet companies. So I generally will look at them from a unique perspective, downloads, monthly active users, and I try to paint a picture where if this company got big, and this company continued to reach this audience, what value could we place on each user um, type of methodology? So I would say when I look at consumer internet deals, it tends to be more of a fluid process in terms of how it's scaled. I think what's more important for a consumer internet company, they are probably the only types of companies that you can pay extremely ridiculously high prices for, is because the viral, the viral growth in a consumer internet business is insane. Like you can go from 10 million users to 100 million users in a year and not have a problem. Now there are very few companies that can do that, but you can't get enterprises, enterprise software companies to do that. Primarily because you gotta hire a bunch of sales guys, the sales guys go sell, they take time to get productive, and then if you wanna double the revenue, generally that means you have to double the sales force, then you gotta do it again. So sales, I would say enterprise sales, enterprise companies tend to scale in a more step function, whereas you can get sort of the exponential growth curve in consumer internet companies. And if there's any company that you'd be willing to pay high prices for, it's probably consumer internet companies. Yeah. Was there a question back there? All right. Any others? What I do is, I think, um, I think too often the entrepreneurs don't do the work of figuring out the right, they don't target, they target a firm, they don't target the partner. And it's the partner who's going to be doing the deal, whether that be a male or a female. So you should see what the partner likes. Like it's not that hard today to follow them on Twitter, to read their blogs, to see what kind of companies they've invested in and understand what stage they like. Like I just told you what I typically like. I'm more than happy to meet with you and give you my perspective on your seed company because I don't know if you're gonna, you know, one day if you're successful, you'll grow into a later stage company and hopefully the advice I gave you is helpful and you'll think of me and that's awesome. But that's not my bread and butter and I always tell people that. So think about the person you're meeting with, what are their likes and if you can get a credible intro through someone in their network, like you can go in their LinkedIn network and say, oh, I'm connected to you through him or her. Have that person intro, you know, do a friendly email. Even do the work and, and write out the email like, hey, Bob, hey, you know, I know uh, John from blah, blah, blah. I call it a click to forward. People love click to forwards. Send them an email, send them a click to forward, very low friction, but super high conversion rate. That's the way entrepreneurs should approach venture capitalists. Because I'm only looking to do one to two investments a year. That's it. Most partners are only looking to do one to two investments a year. But you're looking at 100, like wholeheartedly looking at 100. Not like the email over the transom. Like I don't count that as part of the 100 because then, you know, that'd probably be like 500 in a year. But the ones that get attention are the ones where you say, I know, you know me as a customer. Like think of, think of approaching a VC like that way, right? When you get spammed email from Groupon, you're like, they don't know me. I never bought a manicure. Why are you showing me manicure deals? I don't need a pedicure. Like why are you sending me pedicure stuff? Like the one time maybe that person bought that pedicure for his or her girlfriend. That person gets spammed all the time with like, I mean, there's no science behind that, right? I mean, that's just annoying. So if you know, like I've already told you, I'm into marketplaces. I'm into SaaS applications. If you send me into something security, 
I'm going to shoot you into one of my partners. You send me something on like chips, I'm going to send you to that partner because that's not my domain expertise. You can get all this with like 15 minutes of work because the one thing that I find like I don't know why people do it. It's just the the cold email. So like everyone has their email listed on their site. An entrepreneur will send an email to all the partners with the same message about how they're looking for capital. Like seriously, does that work? It doesn't work. It just gets goes into the delete folder, right? But if you craft an email that says, "Hey, I understand you're looking at companies in this and this area. You know, we've been growing at X and X rate. Um, I'd love to talk with you." Um, you know, we're thinking about raising capital, um, you know, in the next six to 12 months. Love to just have an early discussion with you and tell you about the business. Low friction, low commitment, right? Versus the, I'm raising 20 to 25 million growth round. I've already got a term sheet, so you need to decide in the next seven days. But, I mean, that, that could work if you've been meeting with the person regularly over the, over the past year. They get to know you. They get to know what you said you were going to do and what you executed upon. That can work, but it doesn't work for everyone. Yep. What are some advantages and disadvantages of going with uh, CVC versus institutional VC, for example? How does, how does an entrepreneur decide the right fit? Yeah, so best fit, like how does an entrepreneur decide whether to go with a CVC versus an institutional fund? I think. <coughs> I mean, that's sort of, it's a really broad question because, like I said, there's a lot of variation between um, CVCs. I think the real question is why you would take Intel Capital's money versus any other uh, CVC, right? Um, I, I think at the end of the day, you have to look at how the person who's making the investment from the CVC is incentivized and how do they define success in their business? Like, if you went to an institutional investor and you asked them, what makes you successful? You probably know the answer, right? Make you and your LPs a boatload of money, right? Like, that's, that's basically it. Can you make meaning and can you make money? Those are two things for an institutional, right? When you talk to a CVC, though, you both have to make meaning, you have to make money, and the meaning has to be meaningful to the, to the strategic confines of that corporation, generally speaking, right? Those are two really hard things to do, I think. Um, and I would argue that a lot of CVCs are not successful at that model. Because how do you measure strategicness of a deal? How do you measure whether this deal was strategic or not, right? What is, what is that litmus test of the strategicness of a deal. If it's, if it's, if we don't do this deal, we're not going to be able to sell more X, Y, and Z, that's a really high bar. Then I would ask you as an entrepreneur, if you change your strategy, because this CVC wants you to change the strategy, now you're beholden to their strategy. What happens when their strategy shifts because they didn't make their quarter? What happens when you've implemented all this extra software into your mobile app application that you now have to rip out because, oh, not relevant anymore, or those guys got fired, so that business unit isn't going to work with me anymore. What happens when the, the CVC says, you know what, this venture thing was kind of cool, it was hip, and I wanted to do it because everyone else seemed like you know, it was the right thing to do, but you know what, we're getting out of the business now. Who is the person who's going to shepherd that, that, that investment that went into your company? Like These are things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't think about when they take CVC money versus institutional money. right? I don't want to name the ones who got out when the bubble burst, but there are a lot of corporate venture capital programs that just stopped. And then, oh, by the way, like in the last four years, they've come back because it's cool. It's in vogue now. Like We should be doing it. But are they going to be here when the next bubble bursts? Because I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to say that what's going on right now is not sustainable. I'm not saying that there's a bubble yet. And I'm not saying that this feels like 07 and next year is going to be 08. But what I am saying is that what I'm seeing, a lot of companies are raising money with a, lot of, with, with a discount that is not very discounted. And I've seen that story twice. 
and it doesn't end well for anybody. But it's a great time as an entrepreneur to raise capital because risk isn't being discounted that much. Now, I'm not going to sit here or stand here today and, and give you a prognosis that, gosh, we're going to go into a recession next year because that wouldn't be cool and no one would probably believe me. And I don't, I'm not sure I totally believe that right now. But what I am looking for is, where is the next asset bubble? Like we all went through the housing crisis. A lot of us went through the dot-com boom and bust. But the question is, where is that next asset bubble? Because with interest rates being held low right now, and being probably held low for the next foreseeable future, and the Fed pumping in and propping up the US economy, what happens when that spigot starts to, starts to shut off? Like what's going to happen? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know what's going to happen. I wouldn't tell you if I knew. Um, <laughs> but what I will tell you is that I've already seen two cycles in the tech, like how it directly affects the technology. And technology is, is really a small, small microcosm of the entire US economy when you look at housing and energy and blah, blah, blah. So I keep that in perspective. But what I tell entrepreneurs is don't worry about the things that you can't control. Only worry about the things you can control. So don't fret about you know, an earthquake or some polar frost or polar vortex and how that affects your you know, warehouse. Those are things that you cannot control. But think about who you can hire, how you can be excellent in front of your customers so you can get more customers. Think about how the type of culture that you're building within your company. Those are the things that you can actively control. And then there's some things you're just going to have to leave to chance because you were crazy enough to do a startup anyways. So you're just going to have to leave things to, to just be the way that they'll be at the end of the day. I think we have time for one more question. I want to respect uh, everyone because I know everyone has real jobs. Um, if there's, is there any last pressing question? I can stay um, for a little bit afterwards if you guys want to talk um, like one-on-one -on -one or, or in a small group setting. But hey, it's been fantastic being here. You guys are great. I love the questions. Um, I'll leave a stack of business cards here if you guys want to reach out to me. And uh, thanks a lot for having me this morning. Appreciate it.